Now, live from Whitney Media, 1460 WVOX, the Greenberg Report, with Greenberg Town Supervisor Paul Feiner. You can join in the conversation at 914-636-0110. Now, on 1460 WVOX, here's Greenberg Town Supervisor Paul Feiner. I'm Bob Greenberg, um, Town Supervisor, and uh, today we have a very interesting program. Evidence shows that the children of Holocaust survivors, referred to as a second generation, can be deeply affected both positively and negatively by the horrific events that their parents experienced uh, during uh, World War II and during the Holocaust. The intergenerational transmission of trauma is so strong that a Holocaust related influences can even be seen in the third generation, children of the children of survivors. So today we have as our guests um, a second generation um, survivor, uh, Shelly Greenspan, and her daughter. So could you just start by telling us a little bit about yourself and your experiences? Uh, sure. So um, hi, everyone. It's Shelly Greenspan on the line here. Um, both my parents are Holocaust survivors. They come from a town, uh, two different towns in Marmarish County in uh, northern Transylvania. My father comes from the town of Siget, which is where Ellie Wiesel was from. And my mother comes from a small village in, uh, in Borsha in Romania. And um, uh, my parents um, went through the war, uh, of course, being Jews, um, in that part of Romania, they had normal childhoods up until about 1940. Um, in 1940 is when the Hungarians came in and took over their part of Romania. And at that point, they imposed very harsh anti-Jewish laws. And that's really when, you know, their childhoods ended um, after four years, um, the, hung, the um, Germans came in, 1944, and very quickly, within uh, two months, they had uh, forced all the Jews out of their homes, uh, put them in ghettos, and transported them by cattle cars to Auschwitz. So my mother was actually in two concentration camps with her older sister, Sarah. She was in Auschwitz and another one called Stutthof. My father, meanwhile, was called up to something called forced labor. This was um, uh, something that the Hungarians set up to, uh, for uh, Jewish men of military age to support the Hungarian army, uh, really do the most dangerous work. Oh, we have to take a break, and then we'll be right back, and we'll learn more about your parents and um, your experiences, and um, we'll hear from your daughter as well. This is a, about a five-minute break, and I hope I won't um, be interrupted by my cell phone the next time. So sorry, I'm Paul Feiner, Greenberg Town Supervisor. <laughs> Now, back to the Greenberg Report on 1460 WVOX. Once again, here's Greenberg Town Supervisor Paul Feiner. Hi, um, I'm Paul Feiner, and um, my guests are uh, Shelley uh, Greenspan and her daughter um, Emily, and their second and third generation um, survivor, uh, uh, children and grandchildren of uh, grandchild of. Um, of Holocaust survivors. I was going to ask um, uh, Shelley and also Emily if they could describe their um, their experiences talking about um, the Holocaust with your parents when you were growing up and, um, and your um, grandparents. So maybe we should start with Shelley and then Emily. Sure. So, you know, I, I can't remember a time not knowing about the Holocaust but I, I also don't remember my parents actually sitting me down to tell me about it. I just always had this feeling that even though, you know, my parents were lovely, well-adjusted, my mother was warm and friendly and bubbly and 
life of the party, but there was always something a little bit under the surface. There was some kind of a a fragility about her. There was some kind of a sadness about her. And, um, you know, that made me, um, you know, I felt very bad as a child. And I felt that, you know, no matter what I could do, I, I could never take that away. So I grew up, you know, very well behaved. Um, I didn't want to challenge uh, my parents in any way. I, I knew that there was this, you know, deep hurt and sadness there. So um, I would uh, just be very well behaved. I wouldn't really express my desires and my needs because I felt always that, you know, that they needed my protection. Um, eventually, um, in 1996, uh, my parents both made tapes for Steven Spielberg's Shoah Foundation, and um, I got a lot of information that way, too. And, you know, in their later years, they started uh, speaking more about their experiences. Um, my mother used to talk about her early childhood, which was very happy, and she kind of preferred to focus on that. But, you know, eventually she told me, um, you know, the stories of her losing her family and uh, my father, too, um, and, and her experiences. Um, How many um, the, uh, family members did they did, uh, your parents lose? Oh, my gosh. Well, my father, my father had one sister and two parents, and he lost. He was the sole survivor of his family. And, you know, uh, grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins, he figures there's about 50 people in his, you know, extended family that lost their lives. My mother was relatively speaking more fortunate, even though that's a funny word to use here. But um, she comes from a family of six kids, and um, her mother and her two younger siblings um, were gassed immediately on day one at Auschwitz. But her sister, Sarah, she stayed with her through the war. She survived, and her two older brothers and her father survived, so that was pretty miraculous, um, considering, you know, what they went through. Um, Emily, um, did you um, learn about the Holocaust from uh, from your mother or grandparents when you were growing up? You know, it's a great question. I think, on some level, and it's funny when I hear my mother talking about it, it's, it feels it feels very um, true to me as well. I think I always knew. Um, I don't, I don't remember either being told, um, you know, being sat down and told, you know, this is what happened to grandma and grandpa, but I, I always, um, I was always made aware of that, um, of their stories of where they came from. Um, and I didn't ask them about it and they didn't tell. Um, and I think I, my, my, both my mother and I have been trained to, through various different storytelling groups to tell the story of our grandparents, or, uh, you know, my mother's parents, my grandparents' survival um, to middle school and high school audiences for the third generation um, in New York. The group is called 3GNY, so that's what I was trained through. And I, I've connected with many other um, descendants of survivors through that group, and I've heard this, um, this kind of phenomenon described. I believe they describe it as kind of a double-closed door, on the one hand, you know, the, the survivors, they keep this door closed. They don't want to, I think there's a reluctance to traumatize their children and their grandchildren. They don't want to tell the story. Um, although with grandchildren, it's been documented that they tend to be a little bit more open. And so for me, this was the case. They never came to me and said, like, you know, look, this is all what happened to us. Um, I knew that they had made those show of tapes that my mother mentioned. And so I kind of, even though I had incredible curiosity as a child, I didn't want to, you know, I had, my door was closed too. I didn't want to open up their trauma. I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to upset them. Um, so I figured, I told myself, you know, I can read all these uh, books about the Holocaust. I read at pretty much every, like, young adult Holocaust book I could get my hands on when I was, you know, 10 or 11 or so um, to get sort of answers to maybe what kind of things happened to them. And I always knew at the back of my head that I had these show tapes that I could, that I could, um, look to. And unfortunately they passed away, both of them in 2012. And since then I've become much more involved in, in kind of thinking about their past and in doing this workshop through 3GNY. 
And now I really wish that I had the opportunity to sit down and ask them all these questions and fill in all the gaps between, you know, the answers that they provide in their show of tapes because it's, it's a, such a, I mean, such a blessing that we have those tapes, um, and I'm so grateful for them, but there's still a lot that I would like to know that I, that I unfortunately, um, that I unfortunately don't know. You know, um, I was reading about um, uh, survivors and uh, survivor parents have a tendency to be very involved in their children's lives, um, and many Holocaust survivors, their children are super successful. Um, and I'm wondering if um, when you were growing up, um, um, Shelley, you know, how your parents, um, you know, dealt with you. Were they... Did they demand that, you know, you study hard and were, were they very strict and you well, know, was it um, they, yeah, so, you know, they, oh, we they have to take were, a break right after this okay. break. We'll, we'll, just, we'll, okay. we'll focus on that. I'm Paul Feiner, Greenberg, Massachusetts. Now, back to the Greenberg Report on 1460 WVOX. Once again, here's Greenberg Town Supervisor Paul Feiner. Good morning. I'm Paul Feiner. I'm the Greenberg Town Supervisor. And my guest has been uh, Shelley Greenspan and her daughter, Emily Greenspan. And they're discussing growing up um, as uh, ch- children, children and grandchild of um, Holocaust um, survivors. And before um, the break, I was asking um, if um, the if, if uh, Shelley's uh, parents were over involved in her life, um, as many uh, Holocaust um, survivors' children have experienced. Emily, I mean, um, Shelley. Sure, I think. Uh, Shelley, go ahead. go ahead, Emmy. No, no, I, I, this is for you. Okay. And then right. Emily, um, you could then answer also. <laughs> okay. So, um, you know, basically, I just, um, for, for my parents, education was very important. Um, you know, they had been deprived of an education. My mother had no formal education after age 13. She was a very bright woman, but, um, you know, once the Hungarians took over in 1940, she was kicked, at, well, the Jews were kicked out of secular school. So, it was very important for her that I get a good education. Uh, my father also, he would have gone on to university, very bright man, also denied the opportunity to educate himself. So it was it was very critical to them that I get a good education. There was never any question that, you know, of course I was going to go to college. Um, they were also, you know, despite all what they suffered, they weren't, they were not fearful people. They encouraged me to travel. Um, I did my junior year in France. They were, you know, very encouraging of me taking that opportunity. So, um, you know, they didn't let fear rule their lives or or my life. And, um, yeah, they were very um, encouraging about me pursuing uh, my education and a career. So uh, that's, you know, that's how I experienced that because that, those were all the things that they never had the opportunity to to pursue. That was taken away from them. So they wanted to make sure that I had all that opportunity, and they gave it and, to me. Right. And, Emily, um, how was your experiences, you know, growing up um, with your parents and your grandparents? Um, uh, did you feel that uh, your um, – your parents also kept pushing you to be successful? Yeah, I mean, I think I, it's a great question. Um, I think among many Jewish communities, there is this pressure 
to um, excel academically and even financially. And I think that this is not, um, I think sometimes the Jewish community is seen as sort of exceptional, being this mi model minority and doing really, really well. Um, even despite, you know, there's relatively small numbers, but I think this is a, this is a phenomenon that kind of exists, um, almost in a universal way among people who have experienced oppression, people who have been denied their rights, um, when they do get the opportunity to, to pursue education. I think a lot of times, uh, you know, maybe the parents who have, who have fled, you know, an unsafe country or an unsafe area and, and their children have the opportunity to study. Um, I think that there often is a lot of pressure. You know, you, you have this big opportunity. We see it a lot with, uh, with immigrant families, um, you know, of all backgrounds today as well. I happen to be a college counselor. I work with um, predominantly um, black and, um, and immigrant uh, students from, or Latino students, Latinx students. Um, and I see this very much, the same exact, you know, pressure to succeed and, um, and, and to, to, you know, have opportunities, have a sort of financial stability that they're, that the parents didn't, um, didn't have access to education that the parents didn't have access to. For me personally, I don't feel that my family and my mother's parents didn't push me to do, uh, to be any one particular thing or to study really hard. It was kind of this unspoken thing. Um, and I put a lot of pressure on myself from kind of this whole atmosphere of, you know, of, uh, that I was, that I was raised in. But I think there's something really remarkable about my grandparents and especially my grandmother with whom I was very close. She would always say again and again and again, you can be anything you want to be, but it has to make you happy, you know? And so she would go through different professions, you know, it was, it was a stereotypical profession, a doctor, a lawyer, you know, those things were okay. Um, you know, so there was a little bit of a, maybe a pressure to, to be something that, you know, to, to <laughs> pursue a career that would make me a lot of money. But at the same time, she also said, if you want to be a teacher, be a teacher. I think that that's a very noble career, you know? So she, she just wanted me to be happy. Um, and I think that that's something that, you know, despite the trauma that she, that she experienced and my grandfather experienced, even though, you know, something like a teacher wouldn't make me as much money, a role as like a teacher wouldn't make me as much money as, as a, as a different career path. Um, I think she had kind of the perspective enough to see that, you know, if I, if I were to have a happy life, I would need to be doing what I wanted to be doing, whether or not that made me, you know, a lot of money to kind of cushion me from, um, from some horrible things that could happen. I think she, yeah, as my mother said, they were not feel fearful people. They let my mother travel at a young age. You know, they, they had this amazing kind of perspective that, that allowed them to, um, to be a little bit more free than, than you might otherwise think. Um, I want to say, yeah, so Shelley, you went um, to Romania and also visited Auschwitz. And could you tell us about uh, your experiences and, did Emily uh, join you? Yes, um, we were very fortunate. One year ago, we went to um, to Romania and to um, Hungary and to Poland, Auschwitz. Um, I went with with Emily. Um, it was at the time it was the seventy fifth anniversary of the deportation of the Jews uh, from Northern Transylvania to. Um, to Auschwitz. So we uh, we went back there, went, uh, we're based in my father's hometown of Siget. Uh, we actually saw the house that my mother grew up in, in Borsha, which today is the post office. Um, and, uh, you know, it was, it was an odd experience because we, um, we wanted to go inside and take some photographs. And we were with a Romanian speaking uh, tour guide and the woman who was running the post office was was pretty nasty to us. Uh, so we we experienced this kind of fear of us because we were Jews. They didn't know what we were doing there. They were suspicious somehow that we were, you know, coming to take back, you know, to lay our claim to to the house. Perhaps it was, it was very odd. So we met those types of people, but we also met people that maybe younger people that were a lot more open-minded. And as a matter of fact, a few of them opened up a gate. We weren't supposed to go behind the post office, but some women opened up a gate for us and we went back there. And I was so delighted because I could picture my mother and her siblings running around. It was 
beautiful back there and you can see the Carpathian Mountains in the background and rolling hills. And I could just, you know, it just put me in touch with what it must have been like to, to grow up there, you know, before the war and, and, and how beautiful it was. Um, but yeah, so it was, it was quite a trip. And, and then, you know, we, oh my God, we, we did make it to, we went to Auschwitz, um, which uh, was a little shocking in a way because it's, it's a big tourist attraction. Uh, I think there's a million visitors a year. So you, you saw busloads of people coming in and out and, uh, you know, you have to sort of rush your way through, which was a real shame. And of course, you know, um, it's really shocking. I mean, you see some horrible, gruesome things, um, the gas chambers, the crematoria. And, uh, you know, it's really heartbreaking. Yeah, and, um, I, I went to Auschwitz with um, my um, sister and um, her family. My niece had a odd myth in Warsaw. We have to take a break, and then we'll be right back. Um, and we're talking with Kelly Emily um, Dreams and about being second and third generation survivors of um, children of and grandchildren of survivors of the Holocaust. Now, back to the Greenberg Report on 1460 WVOX. Once again, here's Greenberg Town Supervisor Paul Feiner. Hi, this is Paul Feiner. I'm uh, the Greenberg uh, Town Supervisor, and my guests are Shelley Greenspan and Emily Greenspan, and we're talking about um, the Holocaust, and we were talking before um, the break about Auschwitz and um, visits to um, um to the horrific uh, locations where the concentration camps were. Um, Emily, what was your uh, thoughts when you were there? Yeah, I mean, I, similar to my mom, it was it was just it was jarring, it was um, disturbing, um, but it was also not necessarily visiting out the Auschwitz part, but but um, but more so visiting Romania and where my grandparents lived. It was like kind of a spiritually healing um, experience to go back to, um, you know, this place and to see what they saw. And my grandmother would tell stories about waking up um, every morning and seeing this beautiful mountain outside of her bedroom window. And, you know, they lived on a dairy farm. It was a rural life. Um, and so to get to see that kind of beautiful nature was really, I mean, just absolutely so incredible, but at the same time, you know, as my mother mentioned, there was we were not always met with such um, friendliness, and there is or there has been a resurgence of anti-Semitism. And perhaps I shouldn't even say resurgence. I don't know if it ever really went away to begin with um, in that area and in Eastern Europe more broadly. Um, I think we we actually went with a group of um, other descendants of survivors from that same area, and some of them were told. Uh, some of them were a bit more religious. My mother and I, I would say, were secular. We, you can't tell just by looking at us that we're Jewish. Um, but, you know, some of the folks on this trip, they wore yarmulkes. They were, you know, more visibly Jewish. And they were told to be, you know, ex especially mindful um, because they could be targeted for, you know, appearing uh, visibly Jewish. And I happened to um, have the chance to visit a few friends that I have um, in, in the Czech Republic and in Austria just shortly after this trip, and I was really excited. I don't want to say excited exactly, but and I was I was eager to share my experiences with them um, and my story because I, I had a feeling that they, you know, they or they told me outright they didn't know any Jews. Um, and uh, I had a feeling that they probably harbored some really um, uh, unfortunate, to, this, to say the least, um, anti-Semitic attitudes just because, you know that they're in Eastern Europe. It's it's this is kind of anti-Semitism is normal. Um, and lo and behold, when I talked to my friends about this, some of them didn't want to admit anything, didn't want to you know challenge anything I was saying. But one of them was a dear friend to me. She she kind of raised all of these really 
um, you know, really disturbing things that I had only ever read about in, <laughs> in books, actually. I'd never encountered someone who outright said to me, you know, the Jews are controlling all the money in the world and, and, and these kind of things. And, and I talked her through these things and I told her why they were wrong. And it was really at first hard for her to understand because that's all she grew up with. But by the end of, I stayed with her for actually two weeks. By the end of the two weeks, um, you know, I told her a lot more about, about me and my family and not just the horrors that my family experienced, but also the beauty of our culture and our tradition. And she was excited to, to meet more Jewish people and to, to learn more. So I think really, um, and to know that there was actually even a synagogue in her town that she didn't even know was there because it was just so closed off to the community. That's actually one of the most interesting things to me about Europe is that Oftentimes, the, there are, there are synagogues still standing, you know, in, in many towns across Europe. Um, uh, whether or not they have a community inside keeping them alive is another story. In the town that she lived in, it's, it's called Graz, G-R-A-Z, in Austria. They happen to have a functioning synagogue, and we tried to go there. You know, she was actually really excited to go there. Um, she wanted to learn and see and whatever. And we arrived, and they were very, uh, <laughs> I don't even know what the, they were very I guess you could say standoffish. Um, they didn't want to let us in. They wanted me to provide my passport and photo ID, other photo ID um, with that kind of documentation that I was Jewish well before coming um, for the following Shabbat service on Friday night service. Um, and I said, can my friend come in? And they said, oh, absolutely not. You know, we only allow Jews in here and you have to do all this, you know, this whole process beforehand. Um, and so I think it's really, uh, in another way, like I described before, it's like kind of this double door. I mean, not that, not that most people are, you know, now like my friend wanting to actively wanting to learn about Jewish people, um, in, in their hometowns and, um, in Eastern Europe. But, but at the same time, the Jewish community there is so traumatized and rightfully so, because there have been so many recent anti-Semitic attacks that they don't want to risk letting anybody in their doors that could, that that's an outsider, you know? And so, the effect is that, on the one hand, my friend doesn't get to learn. And on the other hand, maybe maybe the community stays a little bit safer. I don't know. It's, it was just, it was a really, um, the whole experience was quite heartbreaking and, and very, very intense. And I'm actually working right now, since this whole experience last year, I'm working on writing a book about part memoir, part biography. So part biography from my grandparents and part memoir, my experiences um, uh, visiting Eastern Europe. That is um, you know, so um, you know so interesting, um, um, Shelley or Emily. Uh, do you think that the Holocaust could um, be repeated? Uh, do you think the world has learned you know lessons? Um, you know when you were talking about how beautiful uh, Romania was with the uh, beautiful scenery and um, uh, Shelley appearance, um, you know great childhood. You know, you, they probably thought that everything was perfect and it never could happen uh, to them. Do you think that it could happen to us? Well, I mean, I don't think it can happen to us in, in, in exactly the same way. But, I mean, I think it has been happening very sadly, you know, since the end of World War II. They have been atrocities. There have been genocides. Um, you know, you look at uh, what happened in Rwanda, what happened in Bosnia, uh, what happened in Myanmar with the Rohingya. Um, it's, so, I mean, what what can we do to fight it? You know, hopefully, hopefully by telling these stories about the Holocaust, you're not just telling some, you know, bits of history. You're you're trying to make people understand. Um, the extreme conclusion that propaganda, hurtful words, can lead to, in the end, genocide. You're trying to, you know, fight stereotypes, biases, bigotry, you know, not just for the Jewish people, but for any marginalized minority. And I think you just have to keep Speaking out, and you want to be—you don't want to be a bystander. We have to teach our young people not to be bystanders when they see something wrong, say something. 
um, the HHREC, the Holocaust and Human Rights Education Center that I'm part of that works with second and third generation survivors and survivors and tries to teach the lessons of the Holocaust. You know, they say be an upstander, not a bystander, you know, take action, you know, find your inner moral compass. Don't just stand by. I mean, the Holocaust happened in part because, you know, otherwise good people, quote unquote, they, they were bystanders. They, they let, they didn't challenge Hitler's words. They didn't challenge what was happening. They, and, it, and, you know, the end result was six million dead. It's, um, so I think, you know, it's, um, we just have to keep fighting. Uh, unfortunately, we um, the program's over, and I just want to thank both of you for uh, joining us and um, highlighting uh, the experiences that uh, you both have as a um, child of a survivor, survivors and grandchild of a survivor. Thank you very much, um, Shelly Greenspan and Emily Greenspan, for being part of our program today. I'm Paul Feiner. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.